Good morning. This building right here, uh, I know that you're not familiar with 17th or 16th century Google 3D maps, um, but this one right here is a very important building uh, for the Reformation. Um, this is uh, an atlas. These sorts of things actually were pretty dangerous to make because if you were painting pictures of cities that were accurate, that you'll see here, this is defensive works. You have all the administrative buildings, major sports of city. This could you use for military planning. So being an artist in this period is a dangerous thing if you're making accurate pictures. Um, but this building right here, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a quiz. Um, born on the 4th of July. What do you know about that? Well, uh, can, can we get the focus a little bit down for this? I don't know if that is possible. Um, what year is important, and that's what that says up there, what year is important for the direction of the Protestant Reformation and the subsequent direction of Protestant and later Reformed exegesis, doctrinal development, and hermeneutics? First hint is a major disputation. Second hint, grace, free will, purgatory, indulgences, penance, and papal authority all came up in this event. Last has nothing to do with Tom Cruise. Um, and there's also, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the slide's a little bit broader than the screen. Um, but anyone want to take a guess? What year? 1517. Close. Not on the 4th of July, though. That's coming up next week. Uh, that would be October 31st, 1517. Whether uh, Luther nailed it or mailed it, it was posted. Um, so, yes, here on the 4th of July in 1519, Sola Scriptura, the Leipzig debate. Uh, it was four weeks. Um, and Martin Luther and Johann Eck, as well as many others, but it picked up on the 4th of July, 1519. That's when Luther walked in. Now, what you've got in this debate, I've tried to sum up about three weeks of debate in this little conversation. There is no transcript of this conversation. We have a lot of reports of this conversation. Uh, you get letters from Eck, you get letters from Melanchthon, you get letters from all sorts of people, but I'm, I'm using a little creative license in telling the story, so bear with me. But it's summing up a lot of um, of the conversation. This is one of the one of the side effects of Sola Scriptura when you're wear, sporting a haircut like this is you grow hair and get married. Um, but this is Martin Luther about 1520. So he makes this claim that papacy does not exist by divine right, de jure divino, and Eck responds, but every corporate body needs a head, to which he says, Christ is the head, but Peter's the rock of the church. That's his confession of faith, not Peter himself, but the Council of Constance said so, 1414 to 1418. You may remember, Council of Constance is where Huss was condemned as a heretic. Um, and to which Luther says, well, no council can originate doctrines. It can only confirm what Scripture already says. And for that point, just see Augustine, um, letter 82 to Jerome on Scripture. Um, so the Council of Constance can err and did. Well, the Pope has power over souls in purgatory. Purgatory is not in Scripture. Maccabees says it is right here on the PowerPoint would be. Um, Maccabees is not in the canon. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Jerome says it's not. Um, well, he's just one guy, and he's a translator. Um, St. Jerome? That's kind of like a thing for you, isn't it? Um, so, well, I'm telling the Pope, and then 1520 June, you get ex urge domine. It's basically ex writing most of the papal bull. And Luther's response is, that's okay. I like barbecued bull. Um, that is the beginnings of sola scriptura. Um, it was kind of an epiphany for him. Not because it wasn't important to him, it's in this conversation he realizes the Synod of Nicaea said some really good things and it aired on some others. And so they go back and forth and what ends up saying is, he says, well, councils can air. You're right, scripture alone. And there was a gasp because what happened to the Council of Constance was where Huss was um, condemned. So this is a major turning point. Um, 
Philip Schaff, in his comment on this, actually made the comment that this is the last time in a united Latin Christendom that the Pope issued a bull to the whole of Christendom. And it's the first time in European history where a large part of Europe didn't listen. So it's a major turning point. Fourth of July, you'll remember that. I, I know, it's just because we're in Philadelphia, Fourth of July, it's a you know, thing. Um, but at the Council of Trent, fast forwarding to 1546 on scripture, um, there's two major issues that are happening here. This is a, a major um, council for the Catholic Church. And it's at, it's, by the way, it's after this that Reformed folk refer to Catholics as papists. It's this council. At, before that, they're Catholics. This, make, the, moving from the, the, the authority of the Pope to um, that becoming a primacy over Scripture, that's what gets you the title of Papist to the Reformed in the period. But the first session, uh, or the fourth session on this, the first decree comes out with this, 39 books of the Old Testament, 7 apocryphal, 27 books of the New Testament. That's the, Reform, that's the Roman Catholic canonical Scriptures. The second degree is this. The Vulgate of Jerome is the only authentic Latin edition of those in circulation, and the Vulgate takes priority over the original. Um, and there's, by the way, no printing of anything on faith and morals not authorized by Holy Mother Church. Um, anytime a government tries to crack down on people from distributing information, it goes bootleg. That's true in the modern era. That's true here. So one of the interesting points about this conference here is we already had a bump with Luther that he says, well, wait a second, Jerome says Maccabees isn't in the canon. So here you have a very interesting problem for Trent. Trent says St. Jerome, Vulgate, Blessed Jerome's um, authentic Latin Vulgate, and anyone who says that it's not in the canon is anathema. Anyone who says those books are not in the canon, that's anathema. So all of a sudden, if you want to be kind of countercultural, a little subversive, you start printing Bibles that have Jerome's prologues in them in uh, Paris and Amsterdam and other places, you know, where it says in big, bold block letters, these books, uh, like in Paris, um, Livre non son canonique. <laughs> Get you in trouble. So this issue in the 1540s is huge. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today is something, you guys pass it every day when you walk into the library, there's this nice plaque, it's the seal of the seminary. What does it have on that? You don't have to give me the Latin. What does it say, or what does it say in Greek? Anybody know the verse? Anybody know the verse? Ooh, we got a pop quiz. Um, so, Acts 20 what? Come on, guys. Okay, Acts 20, 26 and following. Anybody got a Bible? They want to look at it? This is about Paul talking to the elders at Ephesus that, um, that he has, he's innocent of the blood of all men because he's not spared from teaching the whole counsel of God. So, Sola Scriptura called the formal principle of the Reformation. Um, it has direct impact for how you do exegesis. And that's what we mean when we say tota scriptura. Now, that's our name for a cluster of ideas, okay? We, a Latin phrase will always get a little attention somewhere. Tota scriptura, meaning that all of scripture, and it's taken from that idea from um, Acts 20, and it's obviously important because you've got a seal over here, it's gonna be on your diploma, you know. That kind of thing. But it's an important uh, realization because as you work through Sola Scriptura and the Council of Trent, this is the context of the debate. Now, you're in a modern class and you're letting me crash, so thank you. But um, this gets an update in the, in the 20th century and there's a paper out there for somebody uh, to do on what goes on with Pius XII, ex divino um, afflatu, and what goes on with Pope John Paul II, 1979 whenever you get the new Vulgate edition, and you get a lot of new comment that says, no, 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 we never meant it like this. We just meant to say that's the authentic Latin edition. We were never saying it had power over the original. 
well, you should tell some cardinals in the 16th century because they got their hats saying this was the case. Um, and we're going to look at some of those today. Now, I have way more material than we are going to get through, so I can chase any rabbit that runs, but I'm not going to unless you have a question about it. Um, this gentleman, Peter Martyr Vermigli, um, he was trained in Padua, one of the top universities in Europe, the pattern for many universities of a humanist stripe. He was also trained in um, basically the best of the uh, scholastic method and content that was running around Italy in the 16th century. Um, he starts reading a variety of resources that are finding their way over the Alps. And by the 1530s, his, he's, he's risen in the ranks, he's teaching, he's as an abbot in several places, he's preaching. And he does something that's almost got him in a lot of trouble, and he ran before it really did get him in a lot of trouble. And he ran to Zurich. Um, he got to a point in 1 Corinthians, and he didn't talk about purgatory which was the locus classicus in around chapter 3, of where you deal with purgatory, either that or in the Maccabees. And he didn't talk about it. And people started wondering whether or not he's really a Protestant. And him and some buddies ran over the, over the Alps and made it to Zurich. And as was the case of many pastors, he was looking for a job. And what he ended up finding was in, uh, with Martin Bootser. So he spent some time with Martin Bootser, but then he ends up as the Regius Professor of Oxford. That's not a small gig. He was deeply involved in the controversies in England regarding the Lord's Supper. He helped shape the reformed tenor of uh, the doctrine of the Lord's Supper in this period. He ends up also at, as an Old Testament professor in Zurich. Um, now, the significance of this is this shows you he has a lot of influence in both places on the continent. He's a very important voice alongside Calvin. I'm assuming you've already read through Calvin on a lot of things, so I'm not going to get too terribly much into him, although you have a wonderful quote on the back dealing with Acts 20 of that handout. I'll circle back to that if we have time. But these two works, um, and they're in trans process of translation, I believe, right now. Um, but this is his work on... Um, Corinthians, and what he's doing is he's lecturing through these things, and they're becoming, and it, that forms the body of his commentary. So what you would do is you would lecture through material, you'd get enough head of steam that you've got an issue you have to talk about, and you'd drop a, what's called a locus, uh, a, a seat, a place of argument, a topic. And eventually what would happen is you would have all these commentaries that would have all of these different loci in them. And after he died, Someone went through all of his commentaries and pulled out all the loci, arranged them, and there's a systematic theology. That comes out after his death in London, 1576. Some editions of Calvin's Institutes actually were keyed to Vermigli that were published in England. So he's, he's important. Um, he's a very important voice um, for Reformed thought. And so what you have in front of you with Vermigli um, and this handout I, I, this is just, I didn't get to go through all of his preface because, well, it's just rich, good, and I would end up translating the whole thing for you. But um, what you have in front of you are pieces, I think, very important pieces that inform uh, Reformed pastors and theologians about how you handle the scriptures. I mean, see if this resonates with anything you do here. Um, Consider, number one, definition of Scripture, a kind of breathing out of the wisdom of God inspired by the Holy Spirit, by holy men, and reco recorded in books and letters. And this is done by the same inspiration, breathed out by the Holy Spirit for our salvation and our renewal. So you have a, a, a linkage between the believer and the Word through the Spirit. Um, no traditions must be thought necessary for salvation which are not firmly and robustly contained in the Scriptures. That is, a, that is a key. Because at Trent, one of the things that was said about purgatory was it's a necessary doctrine. Anyone who doesn't believe in it is anathema. Okay, 
after Trent, you have this come out in 1551. He's dealing with the Corinthians, and he actually drops a, a locus on purgatory. But before he gets to that, he says in the preface, over the course of about eight pages, here's what I mean when I talk about Scripture, and here's how you handle it. They took this preface because they didn't, he didn't have a locus on uh, Scripture like he did for predestination or justification like that, and they put it as the loci for Scripture in this, but it was actually his comment as exegesis how you do Scripture and how you handle it. Um, so he says this, No traditions must be thought necessary for salvation which are not firmly and robustly contained therein. A marginal note, the sum of what the Scriptures teach is Christ properties of scripture. It's firm, it's certain, it's perspicu perspicuous or clear. Five, anything deba debated by the more wholesome theologians, and he's talking about in the history of the church, anything debated by the ho more wholesome theologians always terminates on the testimony of the scripture. It always ends up on scripture, as these are the axioms most known to Christians and from which no one is permitted to stray. Six, the first principium of theology is the Lord has said. There remains no evidence that is to be sought from human senses and our reason, but from the light of faith, whereby we must, must be most persuaded of anything contained in the sacred letters. Furthermore, the perspicuity of Scripture arises from the light of faith. There's no other reason why in 1 Timothy 3 that the church is called the pillar and ground of the truth unless it has the word of God and always employs it in its dogmas and definitions because when it does not do this, it, is, it by no means, or not at all in any way, um, behaves as the church of God. The truth of the scriptures is eternal. And then he cites 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is divinely inspired. The marginalia, sola scriptura, text, no dogmas of the Christian faith can be, firm, can be confirmed by any other method than by the authority of the scriptures. Um, so you see that by the time you get to this point after, um, after the 4th of July in 1519, a lot is happening in how you handle this in exegesis. Now, he also has some interesting questions about how you handle um, biblical history and how you handle the sweep of Scripture. He says something like this. Um, well, necessary doctrines are clearly taught. No doctrine necessary for salvation is unclear. Unclear doctrines cannot be necessary for salvation. So, for example, when you look in his locus on purgatory, he says, even if you wanted to say that the Scriptures had purgatory in it, I don't think they do, but if and if you claim that, everyone that claims purgatory is in the Scriptures at least has the integrity to say it's not clearly taught. Okay, even if it is there, it's not clear. If it's not clear, it can't be necessary. Why are we being anathematized? This was never done prior to this, is the way that he argues. Therefore, a church council that makes an unclear doctrine necessary for salvation, that is Trent, errs. Um, so the Old Testament then is also judged through the New. A passage must be compared with other passages. The consent of the Catholic Church is still not the highest judge. The Old and the New Testaments are no different with respect to their object or substance. And then I love this quote at the end. And this isn't the whole preface, by the way. This is just, he's getting warmed up. Holy Scripture is divided into the law and gospel. The work of the law is manifold. It shows the will of God. It reveals and accuses of transgressions. It reveals the wrath of God. It inflicts punishments, and by these means drives the chosen of God to Christ, who are admitted to him through faith. When they come to him, it leads them for the purpose of executing the will of God when regeneration has been granted, as what must be done is set forth to us in the law. The gospel, however, as Paul defines it, is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. That is, it is the instrument that God uses for our salvation. But don't think these occupy two different books. Some people were saying um, the, the Old Testament is the law and the New Testament is the gospel. Listen to what he says. And this is where you begin to see the Reformed starting to separate a little bit from some of the... Um, it starts bringing more controversy among Lutherans and Reformed and then those that would become the Anabaptists and the Radical Reformation and these things. He says this, Don't think that these occupy two different books, since everywhere, as much in the Old as in the New Testament, they are conjoined. For everywhere you see that sometimes the law and sometimes the gospel promises are driven home. So you've got to do this carefully, and you've got to understand there's two things going on at the same time. God uses the law to drive people to him 
to, have, to receive the promises through faith. He's done that in the Old Testament, and he's done it in the New. So that gives you something on um, Vermigli, but I want to get a little bit more into this, because there's an there's a interesting quite a thing that he does with Augustine. Um, you have to be careful handling his Losi Communes because that was put together after he died. Um, so you have to understand that these, are arrive, these loci have been, arrive, uh, have been developed by someone after him. But um, he bolsters a lot of these points. He actually pulls in Augustine here on Sola Scriptura, which is really fun. Because what he says in, uh, on Augustine, Contra Epistolum Fundamenti, he states, the things defined in the Holy Scriptures must be preferred to all others. That's Augustine. The Holy Scriptures must be preferred to all others, um, chiefly because the truth contained therein is eternal in its duration. And in movements that resemble the traditional points in Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana, Vermigli's points mirror classical definitions of the persecuted of Scripture, the analogy of Scripture, and the interrelationship between the authority and goal of Scripture to lead to Christ. But you've got to think of these things in polemical context, as we've talked about. There's a further application of these principles, according to Vermigli. It is not sufficient that the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Scriptures must be preferred. Vermigli, Vermigli is arguing for reform of the church, and even of the state in some cases, by the Scriptures, and simultaneously arguing for the church's subordination to the Scriptures, not vice versa. He comments on this principle positively with reference to 1 Timothy 3, and I've mentioned that quote there. Um, in other commentaries, for example, his treatment of First and Second Kings, you know, the Latin title Melachim, um, which is actually a Latinized version of the Hebrew. By the way, that's what he was. All these guys that are doing this sort of theology, where they're formulating the doctrine and the loci and all this, they're exegetical theologians. They're doctors of Holy Scripture. Um, so that it, at least for this generation, this era, there is no division you, you do exegesis in order to get to doctrine because doctrine is for living and living is for God. It's all of one sweep. He is arguing mostly in the, his treatment on Melachim, he's arguing against the Catholic apologist and polemical, polemicist Cardinal Stanislaus Hosius, 1504 to 1579. Hosius is best known um, in the period for his works criticizing Protestantism. That's actually how he became a cardinal. Um, his most famous work was the Confessio Catholicae Fidei and his other one on the, or the origin of heresies in our times. And that sought to deal with um, Protestantism. The question that Hosius answers in the affirmative is whether or not the church and the written word of God must be heeded equally, or rather are equally authoritative. Hosius argued that the, since the Holy Spirit speaks to believers as much through the church as through the holy amanuensis, who wrote down the divine letters, he thus claims that the church and the divine letters have equal standing. For Megley's counterpoint is that, there, that, is that in the event that there are controversies and contradictions within the church, which there were, are, and will be, the Holy Scriptures must have priority. Secondly, Hosius argues what's necessary is faith in Christ. He then goes on to say the, that the necessity of the church is the one that impresses the faith in Christ upon the minds of believers in written and spoken forms as well as in acted signs, images, and ceremonies. Vermigli, on the other hand, sets forth the importance of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit for knowing God through faith, whereas Hosius emphasizes the role of the church as an equal authority with scripture, and perhaps even as an authority above scripture. For example, Hosius at one point, here's one of his conclusions, quote, We believe, therefore, not because it is written, but because it has been handed down in such a way by the apostles in the legitimate succession of bishops and priests through the laying on of hands to us. Elsewhere, he says this, quote, yet it cannot be denied that the authority of the church is prior to that of the scriptures, end quote. Indeed, quote, this very gospel voice is the voice of tradition, not of scripture, end quote. This is what's going on. So you tell me whether or not the modern interpretations of Trent coming out of the 20th century square with the guy that got a cardinal's hat for saying exactly what the modern, um, the modern proponents claim. So as a contrast to Hosius, Vermigli argues that the record of the church is mixed. A prime example is the Nicene Synod. On one hand, it ruled correctly on the consubstantiality of the Father and the Son. 
but on the other hand, it introduced, quote, a seed of impiety with respect to satisfactions and times of repentance. Therefore, quote, we cannot state that the church does not err like the scriptures do not err. Close quote. So from this point, Vermigli goes on in his commentary on Corinthians and in the Loci to review the synods of Ephesus, Chalcedon, and Constantinople, pointing out that even at ecclesiastical assemblies, there's a mixture of truth and error. Oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't uh, in Corinthians, that was in his treatment on kings. So in the middle of his treatment on kings, he's dealing with Ephesus, Chalcedon, Constantinople. So this gives you a little bit of a taste of what's going on with him. Okay? So that sets up a very important point for him. He then does uh, a constructive case in, in his work on um, 1 Corinthians on the nature of faith, where he builds a doctrine constructively, and you can see him do it. And the other thing that he does in a different loci, loci is a destructive method. That is, he goes through the doctrine of purgatory and just tears it apart. Um, he tears it apart from the scriptures, and then he says, and oh, by the way, other exegetes that we like say that too. By the way, they died 1,200 years ago. Um, so he's bringing all of it to bear, positively and negatively. And, that, and you can see him, as it were, through his exegesis, arguing for what the reform should be. So this is also not just what he would expect to be taught, because remember, he's training pastors um, and exegetes, but this is what he's expecting would be preached. Um, and then it, one of the things he does, I don't have time to go into it now, but he goes after Augustine's use of a disjunctive, you know, or, to, to per, say, well, perhaps we pay for our sins after this life. And Vermigli tears him apart here and says, quote, a disjunctive, as you see, is used in Augustine's pro proposition. For the truth of such a statement, it is sufficient to establish the other part. Concerning a true article of faith, who would say so ambiguously, either Christ had a true body or a phantasmical one? Or in Christ there was a divine nature or only a human nature? Who would speak that way and be orthodox? And other things of this kind. Those things that pertain to faith necessarily must be defined and must be certain. So he goes after Augustine on those ways, and so he's, you know, he'll use Augustine where he likes him, and he'll say, well, he missed the boat here, but he's human. Scripture is what we reduce to. Um, and then he goes up through some other councils and other things. If you want more of this sort of thing, I've got an article in um, Renaissance and Reformation Review where I basically outline what goes on in this thing. It's called Dominus Dixit. Uh, it came out in 2013, I believe. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is Franciscus Junius, William Ames. The reason I want to talk about them is because they both have different trainings. He was trained on the continent. He was trained at Cambridge. He tends towards Aristotelian uh, sorts of um, sort of things whenever he's making his pastoral applications. He uses fourfold causality, um, you know, formal, material, efficient, etc. And but William Ames is using more of what might be called a remistic method. Every verse gets an analysis, questions, responses, lessons, and uses. So you can get a 30, 40 page excursus or treatment of maybe two verses. Analysis, questions, responses, lessons, uses, just the whole thing like that. His Psalms commentary has never been translated as far as I know. Um, Franciscus Junius, he trained French human, legal humanist. He studied theology at Geneva, roughly uh, contemporary with Calvin when he was 17. At 19, he was a pastor in Antwerp. He missed the, um, he missed the Dutch or the uh, Flemish Inquisition by about 40 minutes to go do a pastoral call. Um, 19, he had bounty hunters after him. Um, because apparently he served a communion where a bunch of Dutch noblemen were talking about, you know, we really don't like what's going on in the Netherlands. Um, 1560, 64, that's a pretty serious time for the Netherlands at that time. Uh, he ends up as a Bible translator in Heidelberg with Tremelius, a major translation of the scriptures into Latin. It's republished as late as the 1720s um, in Zurich. He's a theology professor at Neustadt with Ursinus. He actually delivered Ursinus' funeral oration. He was at Heidelberg, and then he was at Leiden. Um, I did my dissertation on him, so we can go farther than you probably are. I'll exhaust the limits of your curiosity pretty quick. Um, 
William Ames, on the other hand, an English Puritan, studied under William Perkins at Cambridge, theological advisor at the Synod of Dort, professor of theology at Froninger in uh, the Netherlands. He got two degrees. One was taken away by King James. The other one was given to him by the Fries. They're just like that. You know, you can't hire him. He doesn't have a degree. We have an institution. We'll hire him. In the morning, he defended the doctrine of justification by faith. They granted him a doctorate on it. In the afternoon, he gave his inaugural lecture as the new professor. You learn something here about our, our good Dutch brothers. Where there's a will, there's a way. Um, working through on Psalm 2, um, specifically, what you see here is that even though they're different in their training, they're different in the way they use exegetical methods, they are united on what they think of how you handle typology. This is by the time you get to the late six, uh, 1590s, the, for this one, his Psalms commentary comes out posthumously in 1635. But both of them are united on it. And I've got some quotes there for you as well um, on the back. So what you find here with Junius and Ames is they say, look, there's three different ways to handle uh, Scripture. What Junius did, again, he's not a professor of theology, he's a professor of the scriptures, and by the way, as a result of that, he gets to do theology. But he comes out with a very important um, book. It's actually three sections, Sacred Parallels. It's a comparison of the passages of Holy Scripture which are found in the Old and the New Testament, and it's the, a summary of both in the words suitable um, and the consensus of the things, the changes in, of, of the uh, faith, um, and the times, and the truth, and it's perspicuously laid forth in the sources of Scripture, etc., etc., etc. And this is, a, this is a great advertisement at the end. Um, it, also, um, af it also asserts the simplicity of the evangelists and the apostles against the atheists, Arians, Jews, and, M and Muslims. Now, if that wouldn't sell a book. Um, but what he does is he goes through and he shows all the passages in the Old Testament that are showing up in the New, whether specifically or by allusion. And, when, and then for um, William Ames, he, between Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, after his first 30 pages on Psalm 1, he decides to drop a prolegomenon on Psalm 2 because this is how you handle messianic psalms. And he says it this way, Among commentators, there is seen a triple interpretation of this second psalm. One, of the Jews who understand this whole psalm simply about David. Second, of nearly all those fathers who simply explain it as regarding Christ. Third, of the most learned of our theologians. Nostra, nostri theologi. What he means there, other places, he will say, nostri reformati, our reformed. Um, but he uses those phrases interchangeably. Um, and who by a certain composite rationale interpret it as partially about David, partially because it's not fulfilled, and especially properly and chiefly as regarding Christ. Do you, anybody got an eye already and a not yet yet? This is in the 1600s. So for them, these men, this is what it meant to preach the whole of Scripture. You have to do this. Now Calvin did this as well. But before Calvin, there was a sensibility at the University of Paris in the 13th century. It didn't matter whether you were a Franciscan or a Dominican. Now, why is that? Well, because in the 13th century in France, uh, you had a huge Jewish population. They had more freedom than they did other places. Doesn't mean it was great, but it was better than other places. So you had rabbis who were active in Paris. You had Christians at the University of Paris that wanted to learn Hebrew better. They're talking to rabbis. Rashi who there's actually, I've given you a list on, in the references, there's a really fascinating article on, from a Jewish theological exegetical perspective on what Rashi was doing in the Middle Ages. And this particular article says, Rashi was self-consciously purging the Old Testament of any forward-looking look on the Messiah. He was actually expurgating and changing the way that the rabbinic tradition had been, which looked forward to a Messiah. So the charge comes up that if you're Judaizing in the medieval period, what you're doing is you're actually expurgating references to Christ out of the Old Testament, which Rashi did. He would insert rat marginalia. He would insert for if you run across Messiah in the Psalms, he'd say, well, that's in Psalm 2, that's David. And he would actually put a drop a little note or elsewhere it'd be Solomon. So when he says of the Jews, he's not necessarily referring to the, the ancient ones. He's referring to the medieval ones. 
for the course of Christian exegesis, which is in, very indicative, coming off of Origen and Augustine, one of the things that happens in, of nearly all those fathers, and this is a line of exegesis that shows up even in the Lutherans, um, one of the things that's interesting about Augustine's comments on Psalm 2 is the word David never appears. Not at all. It's totally about Christ. So these two, this one says it's totally about David. This one says it's totally about Christ. Nicholas of Lyra on the Franciscan side, for example. Um, Thomas Aquinas on the um, Dominican side. But the interesting thing there is it's not according to whether they're Dominican or Franciscan. It's they're at par in Paris. They're the ones that begin saying, you know what? There's a proximate sense of the scriptures here that has to be the literal sense, but it can't be totally fulfilled, so there has to be a sense in which the literal sense applies in the future. Calvin follows that. The composite sense honors the text. So one of the things you get out of this is these three distinctions. Now, I have covered a thousand years of exegesis very quickly to make that point. But... Um, one of the things that you find out when you're working with, um, when you're working with these folks, one of the things that Rashi, Rashbam, and Yosef Beck or Shore in the medieval period are doing is that they are, well, like I said, they're expurgating things. But listen to the way Rashi, said, what he says about Psalm 2. Why do nations assemble? Our rabbis interpreted this, that phrase the subject of this chapter is a, as a reference to the King Messiah. So he's open on that point. Our previous rabbis, prior to the medieval period, interpreted this way. However, according to its basic meaning and for a refutation of the Christians, it is correct to interpret it as a reference to David himself in consonance with what is stated in the Bible when the Philistines heard that Israel had anointed David as king over them in 2 Samuel 5.17. So he takes it and he, said, he even says that a, this is apologetically important that we refute the Christians even though we have to turn our back on his, our historic understanding of um, the, our own tradition. Um, then when you get to the fathers, Origen and Augustine, um, you could also work through this with Cassiodorus. Uh, Cassiodorus is, a, is an important figure. Um, he uses Augustine's exegetical interpretation of the Psalms and he, that is cited in the Glossa Ordinaria. I can't emphasize to you how important the Glossa Ordinaria is for the medieval period. Why? It is a rolling commentary of all the exegetes that they can muster right in a study Bible. So it's the text in the middle and all of the comments on the side. As late as the 16th century, Nicholas of Lyra and the Gloss are still getting reprinted and everybody's accessing it, Protestants and Catholics, because it's useful for argument. The other one that's in there is um, Isidore of Seville, who takes a posture on Augustine as well. All of these are some of the folks that are referred to as um, the fathers. Um, if you want more on Augustine's method of exegesis, I would encourage you to look in De Doctrina Christiana. He has the rules of Tychonius there, seven basic rules of how he approaches the scripture, how he makes a head-body distinction between Christ and the church and its members, individuals, and how you use that in exegesis. And then he says, all right, just as you have Christ as head of the church, you also have Satan as head of his own body. They have a body, they have members, and you have to be mindful of that too. And this informs how you do some of the spiritual exegesis in the period. Martin Luther, by the way, follows that. Martin Luther had um, a 15, 13 to 15 Psalter, and he says this, all prophecies and every prophet ought to be understood as speaking about Christ the Lord unless where it may appear by unmistakable words to speak about something else. See, Calvin would go the other way, and he would say, it only applies to Christ if it can't apply to something else. Luther says it has to apply to Christ unless specifically it doesn't. And that's a reformed Lutheran difference in the way you do exegesis. Um, he also goes on and says, this is Luther, whoever excessively explains most of the Psalms, not prophetically, but historically, that person follows certain falsifying Hebrew rabbis and crafters of Judaic vanities. He's always understating things, isn't he? Um, thus on Psalm 2, why have the nations raged? The literal meaning concerns the roaring of the Jews and Gentiles against Christ in his passion. Now that's what he's doing in 1513. 
He goes on to do basically the same thing in 1523 and 24, so this is after the Sola Scriptura thing. Um, if you're interested in that, you can check out Luther's Psalm Commentary, um, Auslegung. Uh, it's, the bon it's the first volume, it's on Psalms 125, around page 26 or so in the 1959 edition. Um, but then when you get to the most learned theologians, that's where you see the Western um, exegetes like Nicholas of Lyra. Now, the reason Nicholas of Lyra is fun is because he's, who wouldn't want to be called Dr. Plain and Simple? That was his nickname, even in the medieval period, Dr. Plain and Simple. And um, Nicholas of Lyra gets picked up and used by the Reformed because of that very reason. He's looking for that composite rationale when you work through the text. So Lyra becomes an important voice in the 16th and 17th century exegesis and formation of dogma um, for the Reformed as well. Beza is mentioned, um, I can only mention him briefly. Calvin is interesting here as well. Um, his commentaries are so open and uh, common, I'll just bypass him. You can look at him on your own. But Beza says that the, f the first act as you're, tra as you're moving from your, ex your, your translation to doing your preaching, you actually need to do some sort of paraphrase to help your people understand. He considers that as part of the exercise of preaching. Um, so you can see with someone like Beza, he's making that argument as well. Um, now, what's also fascinating, I think, on the end of this, is Ames goes after, um, well, when you deal with Junius, someone like him, he will go through and he will pick up on exactly what we've talked about, this composite sense. It applies in the immediate context to Christ, I mean to David, and then moves further on to Christ. But Ames is fun because he goes after the quadriga, the fourfold exegesis, you know, where you have the, um, th the, you have the three spiritual senses, um, and then you have the one literal sense. Now remember, as far back as the University of Paris in the Middle Ages, someone like Nicholas of Lyra and Thomas Aquinas on certain points would say, uh, you can't build doctrine on the spiritual senses. You can only use the literal sense because that's the only thing you can argue from. And Ames picks up on that against Bellarmine in this prolegomenon on Psalm 2. So if you can follow all the moving balls. Um, this is what he says, he raises four arguments. He says, the three spiritual senses have no basis in Scripture, first and foremost. So there's your sola scriptura principle for the purpose of preaching the whole counsel of God. Two, the three spiritual senses have no basis in logic, grammar, or rhetoric. Three, if the three spiritual senses did exist, they would render Scripture uncertain, thereby undermining and diminishing its authority. And fourth, arguments can only be established from the literal sense. Now, as to the first argument, Ames is seeking to diffuse what he considers to be a problematic use of typology. He maintains that the usage of 1 Corinthians 10.11, where the Apostle Paul says that all these things happen to them typically, should be explained only in terms of moral examples. And by the way, for Ames, that's of a point of application. That's not a sense. It's an application of the text. As regards the other places, he maintains that these are only analogies accommodated for the sake of illustration or demonstration. They're not really other senses. He also says the type and the thing signified by the type do not constitute two various senses, properly speaking, but they are two parts of one and the same. Now, the fourth argument is kind of fun because it gives him traction against Bellarmine, who's a Jesuit, and Bonnes, who's a Spanish uh, theologian. He says, look, if only the literal sense can never be false, then he goes, he's perfectly justified in arguing in this way. Because from Bellarmine's own confession, this is a quote, efficacious arguments ought to be sought only from the literal sense, since it is not always evident concerning the mystical senses whether they are intended by the Holy Spirit, from which concession it follows that the various senses of this sort are no senses at all, since it is neither a sense from the Holy Spirit which is intent, not intended by the Holy Spirit, nor is there any sense of the Holy Spirit from which cannot be gathered a firm argument. He also makes that a similar point. This has been translated, um, his medulla theologiae, the marrow of theology. Henceforth, also, for one place of Scripture, there is only one sense, because the other senses of Scripture not only are not clear enough and certain, but in fact, they don't exist at all. For what does not signify one thing signifies nothing certain. And then from this, he goes on to develop reasons, uses, and applications to be deployed in preaching. <clears throat> 
Now, that is a whirlwind tour and a half. So here's some conclusions to help you. Sola Scriptura is the formal principle of the Reformation. That is the criterion of authority for doctrine in the church. That's pretty clear. You see that coming forward on what date? Luther enters the debate when? July 4th when? Where? With who? Good. See, tests are not hard. Um, okay, so the formal... Uh-oh. Well, I needed that. Can you click that? It's going to start me over, isn't it? Oh, it's only five slides, so... Anyway, um, once you get to the formal... Once you go through the formal principle of it, the next thing that you, you find after you've determined what the formal principle is of Sola Scriptura, after you go through and you determine that these senses have to be developed, by, as we see in Junius and Ames, when you consider someone like Vermigli, what you're working through with him is he's actually actively saying, look, in order to handle the scriptures well and develop doctrine, here's some of the viewpoints you have to have. So Vermigli's methodology typified and also promulgated reform principles of exegesis in Britain and on the continent. So you see, his work in the 1550s becomes formative. Here, by the time you get to Junius and Ames, Junius 30 years later, 40 years later, Ames almost 70 years later, Junius is highlighting the rootedness of the composite sense of Psalm 2 and the partial fulfillment in David, but the total fulfillment in Christ. Not yet, or already but not yet. So he's pointing out that to do the um, text properly, you have to do both. Ames dismantles the Roman Catholic fourfold method of exegesis, pointing to the literal sense as the only basis for doctrine contra Bellarmine. And what he loves doing here is he loves using the medievals to do it. That's what you have to understand. Whenever they get into polemical usage of the medieval traditions, it's a very ad hoc appropriation for the purpose of dealing with somebody very specific. That's how it comes across. And that's why it's important to realize when you run across these folks using whatever's at their disposal, that's why you can conclude saying, in some ways, their commitments to dealing with the medievals is eclectic. It's here and there. All right, at this time, if you have questions or you're just exhausted, um, what do you got? I'll take a few. If I, if I can cheat and start by asking this question. Okay. Why is it important for Ames to argue that, say, the application of a text is indeed application and not a sense of Scripture? Well, um, one of the things that he... he gets that, by the way, from William Perkins. If you want more of this sort of thing, go to William Perkins. This has been translated. It's on, well, it's an Ebo. Um, it's his preface on Galatians. And Perkins is the one he's following there. Perkins is the one who says, look, these aren't senses at all because they don't give you something firm. Their uses, we're, it's not by saying we're getting rid of the quadriga that we don't, we're not interested in moral uses. But the sense of what the moral application is going to be based on the principle of Scripture is going to shift based on your circumstances. We're committed to the principles, and the applications may change. And we want to give the pastors... He doesn't make this application directly. I'm, I'm condensing a lot. We want to give the pastors the freedom of application. If we fix the moral sense, then how do you arbitrate whenever the tradition disagrees? So that... There's a very nimble sensibility there. By, by firmly doing uh, a literal sense, it actually gives you, it gives you finer grained application to your congregation. Now, he doesn't say it that sharply like I just did, but I'm, I'm condensing a bit. Yes? Calvin Beza. Junius is, is I mean, Junius, Junius 
Nowhere in Geneva does he ever say that he was sat under Calvin, but if you're in Geneva in 1560 to 1562, I mean, are you really not in his lectures? I mean, seriously. I actually had somebody make that argument. I was going, seriously? He got, he, his family's home got burned down. He's 17, homeless. He's eating one egg a day and drinking one glass of wine and walking and doing grammar in order to satisfy his hunger. You'd think he didn't sit under Calvin? I know some seminary students that they don't go through hardship just because they want to go to Geneva. Um, but he was there for a reason. So, definitely under Calvin. Um, or Sinus would be sympathetic to this sort of thing. Other questions? You started us off with a teaser. Yeah. The map. Mm-hmm. The important building. Oh, yeah, that's the Pleissenburg. Um, in good German fashion, well, it wasn't Germans that did it. It was actually World War II that did it. But um, this building, yeah, I guess it was Germans because Bismarck. Um, so this building doesn't look like that anymore. The tower they kept, they, they tore this down, made it kind of, uh, they broadened it out. This is, this is called the Rot House. Don't worry, there's no rats there. Um, it's actually a, a kind of a, a, a government building in the period. Um, but now it's been remodeled. So you can't go see this building there. And the reason it's called the Pleissenberg is because it's on the Pleiss River. You can see it, that kind of flowing there. So the wall's gone. Um, there's a lot of tourist shops, a few coffee shops, good pastries. Um, but yeah, the Pleissenberg. Remind me what town we're looking at. Leipzig. I cut out the part that has the I, I, I cut out the part that has the the royal cre or the crests here and then the Latin, big Latin name on the top. I, okay. This is where the debate, where the debate uh, with Eck takes place. That building, which they kept because it's better to charge tourists to see a spot than not. There's signs all over Germany that say Luther was here. <laughs> And uh, Anthony Lane, when he was talking about, he was showing pictures before, after the Berlin Wall came down, and you know they're celebrating Karl Marx and Luther side by side under the communists, and you know he's got places where he's literally standing in the same spot that he was 30 years ago, and he's standing in the 80s by a place that says Luther was here, and then in the 2000s he's standing like 15 feet away, you know Luther's over here, so it's uh, kind of a that was a fun ride he did. He did a presentation of that recently. Um, other questions? Right. Well, well th thank you. It's actually a perfect breaking point. I really just okay. been running to the rest of it about now. Perfect. So let's, let's talk to the rest of it. Thank you.